things may never go back to that pre-pandemic state where we're just like I, I had a colleague of mine say yesterday that it was like living in the land of rainbows and unicorns before pandemic times. Uh, and when we look back at how we used to live versus how we're living now, it very much is a black and white scenario. We, we took a lot of things for granted that are now coming to, to light. So where I'm going to look at this is how you can do it from a business continuity perspective, uh, how you can do it to limit that risk uh, and limit the uncertainty that you may have to face. So just to give a quick introduction, um, most of you were probably on our January meeting, so you kind of got to meet myself and Michael. Uh, unfortunately, Michael got uh, posted back to Ottawa, recalled to Ottawa, so he's actually out this week. Um, however, uh, I'm taking over for him. Um, so Q5, what we are is we actually specialize in the areas of emergency management, business continuity, and risk management. Uh, we do that through our specializations and through our specific training. And our real focus is to basically assist through collaboration in the creation of prepared and resilient organizations through that process of education, known best practices, really talking and hashing things out. Uh, one of the differences between our firms and some of the other consulting firms that are out there is we're really open to out of the box thinking. And if you really have a weird idea, but don't know how to implement it, don't know what to do with it, sometimes we can sit and we can go through it with you. We can really show you the other angles uh, and really kind of solidify what really could be done with with something that is traditionally not a, a normal business practice or not something that we would normally look at in day-to-day -day operations. So Priya gave an amazing introduction to me. Uh, if anyone wants to really read it, this is my my whole background. Um, one of the other things uh, we've that I've recently done is I have actually uh, increased uh, and, and been certified as a ISO 31000 risk manager, uh, which is the international standard of risk management. So we're, we're continuing to stay in front of things so we can make sure that we're passing on those best practices. So <clears throat> I'm really hoping for a little bit of a different, different take on this presentation. So I want to go through some of the stuff that we did talk about last time, uh, just to kind of bring everybody back into that mindset, uh, restructuring the business to deal with crisis. And then again, this is not a permanent restructuring. These are temporary restructurings. And then 15 other things that I've seen organizations do or I've assisted with. And some of those tactics, I'll, I'll caveat right now. I do have a slide later that caveats everything, but these things are not, they're not a one size fits all. They are very specific to the organization. They were specific to the, the things that were occurring there. And they felt that this was really their only out aside from either claiming bankruptcy or laying off mass amounts of people and reducing the, the staff levels. So this is kind of just to give you know, some examples, some, some things that are commonalities across regardless of vertical markets uh, and, and things that have really been done to show how resilient or how people really do care uh, in, in face of this stuff versus just closing their doors and being done with business. What I'm also hoping here is that when we get through this, uh, some people may have actually gone through all the stuff and done some of the, the risk analysis or the risk assessment, the business impact analysis. And, and maybe if you have specific questions with those or had issues or problems or, you know, you got stuck somewhere. Like, I, I so the reality is, is I don't have a magic eight ball. I really wish I did because it would make my job a lot easier. But unfortunately, I don't have one. And for me to be able to do the best I can to help everybody, I have to know, not, not specifics, but I need to know kind of a general outline of what really the problems are. So if people have specific things that they want to know or have questions about, we are here to support you. Uh, this is just our references section in case anyone's really wondering about where we're pulling stuff from. So, 
you know, we're pulling stuff out of, you know, other authors that have done a lot of research involving, you know, what is the social aspect of how this works, what is crisis management, um, all the ISO standards uh, that come with it, how we look at vulnerabilities and disasters, just random things that we can, uh, we can kind of pull together for uh, giving us a basis of, of understanding. So first things first, let's go back to our other uh, presentation for a couple of minutes here. What we did is we looked at a risk assessment. So what you do basically in a, in a high level nutshell is you wanna look at your identified risks. So anything that could potentially affect the business internally or externally, we want to then assess those and assign them by severity and frequency by the risk criteria that you identified as a business owner. Then we want to rank those from highest risk to lowest risk, because obviously everything is not going to be top priority. We want to then take those top five that are probably the worst. They're probably at the forefront. They probably, they, they may impact you already, or they may just be haunting you in the background because if something goes wrong, these risks are going to come to fruition and they're going to cause major interruptions. So while as soon as someone says, well, do you do risk management? Do you do business continuity? Most people automatically assume that it's a very specialized process. While it is a very specialized process, we also have to understand that we actually assess risk subconsciously all day long. Uh, it's something that we do and we actually make tens of thousands of decisions every day that we don't even think about based on our previous experiences, based on our knowledge, based on our education levels, based on our, what we see in the perception of the world. Every time we get behind the wheel, we put on our seatbelt. Yes, it's law, but we also do a subconscious risk assessment saying, what's the worst case scenario if I don't put on my seatbelt? Well, there's a lot of worst case scenarios, so we put it on. We abide by that law because through time we saw that, you know, not wearing a seatbelt was bad for us or the potential for additional injury and up to and leading to death could occur because we weren't wearing seatbelts. So now that whole process has changed the laws to say it's now a mandatory requirement. People still don't wear them. I mean, most people will, but there are some that won't. Uh, for various reasons. And it is their internal risk process that says they don't have to. Um, other examples is, you know, if you have to drive to the office, you make subconscious decisions. Okay, I have to leave the house 20 minutes early. Oh, but I want a coffee. I got to leave 25 minutes early. You're doing what's called the time estimate, which is actually part of risk management. So you basically said, I have to be at the office at nine o'clock. I can't be late because if I'm late, then my bosses get mad at me. So I backtrack. And then I do a time estimate and I say, okay, this is when I have to leave my house. While we don't see these things as actual risk management, uh, they are actually some of the very 101 building blocks that leads to a risk management mentality. So while you may not be an expert in it, you do have quite a bit of experience. You just need to tap in and find those parallels. Then we went on and we talked about a business impact analysis. So some businesses may have this done um, through some processes of loans through BDC, they actually require one. Um, and some of, some of you may have been in business so long that uh, your BIA is just old and dusty and collecting, basically it's a paperweight. Um, so the process of a BIA is looking at what process or what technological function is attached to a department, what those departments do, and how is that technology associated to what they do? So the big question is, is it critical to keep operations moving? Now, if it's critical, and if you didn't have it, operations stops, that's a bad thing. So we obviously need to keep it running. That becomes a critical or an essential function. So the biggest challenge in, in doing a BIA is determining the what is essential, what is non-essential. And that is a very sometimes hard gray area question. So I just put up three questions here that you can ask yourself for every function or every process that will then at least give some assistance to trying to dig into whether or not it is a critical or non-critical function. 
So if your business can operate at a hundred percent without the function or the technology, it is not a critical function. Now I'm not saying that you can operate indefinitely, but if you can operate for a day or three days or a week without the function until it comes back online, it's really not critical. If it, will affect your functions and your operations at what percentage can you continue without it so if you can operate if it's lower than 50 percent then it's you're starting to look into that kind of that critical range if you can operate at 75 percent for a few days until it comes back online it will create a backlog but it's not it, it's not a make or break if you're getting into below 50% where it's going to have a major impact on functions and on business and on whether that's selling products or whether that's selling services, then, then you're starting to look at a major influx uh, or a major issue. So then the third question is, what are the independencies with another function or another department which requires that technology? So this is where while you say, oh, we can work at 75% for a couple of days, it's not a big deal. When you start looking at all the interdependencies, then you start to see the additional fallouts from other departments. And then it starts to cascade where we look at one department and it's, oh no, we can work with that. But we don't automatically associate that function with a bunch of other departments. So for example, sales software, some sales software has an inventory management system behind that sales software. And as you sell stuff, it actually will keep track of things for you. So when we go and we say, oh, well, the, the cashiers are down right now, the sales system is down. If we only look at the, the cashier, the customer facing portion of it, it we can, we, there are other ways we can still do business, albeit slower or at less capacity, but we can still do business while that system is coming back up online. The problem is, is that the warehouse staff now have no idea what needs to be resupplied, what needs to be ordered, what's selling out like hotcakes and what's sitting on the shelves. They lost basically the overall vision of the store. And that could cascade into a very large problem because once that system comes back online and you do all your backlog entry, you may find out that, you know, three quarters of your inventory is low and then you have to do mass amounts of shipping and ordering and it's going to just cause that backlog that's going to cascade so we really need to make sure that we don't just look at the one function in the one department but how it interacts with the business as a whole so then when we have both the risk and the business impact we have to merge those together so the risk plus the impact is going to be the realistic scenario that you are going to see or the potential realistic. Now it could be a minor disruption or a major disruption. Uh, this basically will be determined on how bad or how much impact there is. But because you've already sat down and you've already done the risk analysis and you've already done a business impact analysis, you can then say, okay, this is the likely scenario do we have mitigations in place do we have things that we can do that are either backups to these thing these uh technologies do we have alternative strategies to keep operations going while that technology is being fixed or that process is being addressed you know if it takes the rest of the day it might not be a large-scale problem but if you're starting to look at a couple of days into a week you know what what would be normal may now have more major impacts so going back to the example of the sales system, like if you look at it, if a sales system goes down at two o'clock in the afternoon and it's fixed by eight o'clock at closing, yes, it's going to cause a backlog for probably a day or two to get all that stuff put back into the system, but it's not going to cause you a huge delay. If it's down for three or four days and there's a lot of traffic and you're doing a lot of online transactions, a lot of curbside pickup, that could cause major issues in the system because people are now relying on that management software to say things are in stock online. So that could take out your online side. That uh, would then you know, cause a lot of issues and it affects the customer experience, which is where when we restructure our business, we really need to focus. We can be a mess in the back, but out front forward facing, we have to look like we have our stuff under control and we have to look like everything is business as normal as much as we can. 
So to the customer, it looks like a, a, an everyday shopping experience. Now, behind closed doors, it might be a nightmare, but that's the point is to make sure that the customer has the best experience possible because at the end of the day, the customer is the one that's buying the product. So before I go into my big caveat here, is there any questions so far? Hey, Nick, this is Priya. I just have one quick question. Uh, so the information which you have provided, you know, a department-wise management um, is for bigger organizations. When it comes to a small-scale business with just a couple of employees in it, how do they juggle with things, uh, you know, when they have a smaller scale of, uh, you know, business? When we're looking, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's all. Okay. So like when we're looking at smaller scale businesses, obviously this is your technology and your functions are going to be more integrated between kind of a shared workload between everybody. So you're not going to see as much disruption based on a technology because you don't have very many in-depth, expensive, you know, shiny technologies. You're doing it off of like for myself, for example, I work from home on a MacBook Pro and I do most of my work at my desk at home. For me, there's not really a bunch of technological stuff because I work with other colleagues that sit in their home and work. So our biggest risk is what happens with mass internet failure. So if we all lose our internet, one, we then have to resort to phone lines to talk, but we then can't share documents and then it starts to affect what we do. Now, we have workarounds for that. I mean, we can, you know, drive to each other's houses and drop stuff off. We could ship things through UPS same day. If there are other mechanisms that we can do that. But if it was to happen for a month or two months, we would start to feel that pain because of the fact that it's just such a long time to be without that, that simple technology that we all take for granted, which is the internet. Now, if the internet has gone for two months, that's a bigger problem. But um, for small businesses that only have a few employees, you're probably not going to see that delineation by department. So the big, the big takeaway here in doing those risk assessments is that the risk will stay the same. The impact will change because it's not based on department. It'll be based on business as a whole. So you can kind of remove the department function and just do it as if your business was one department because you're probably, it's just a scale thing. I mean, you, you could put in departments and who's responsible for HR and who's responsible for shipping. But the likelihood is, is that there's probably overlap and people are probably supporting each other as, as things get busy. So it's probably easier to remove the department and just go with the business as, as one function to at least map out where there could be potential gaps or weaknesses in those processes. Does that make a little more sense, Priya? Makes sense, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so the one thing I wanna caveat here before I go on is that these things that I discuss or that I give examples on, before anybody does anything, you should go to your respective finance counselors, to your legal departments, or to somebody who has in-depth expertise in certain areas. These are things that I've assisted with, that I've done based on the business understanding their own vertical market and what they need to abide by. So for certain things, if they're a regulated industry, they have certain requirements that they have to abide by. And they're the experts in those industries, in those vertical markets, whether they have unions, whether they have contract employees, these things create other uh, types of nuances um, that I don't want to go into one because I'm not uh, an employment lawyer. I'm not, I, I, my union law is kind of rusty. Um, 
So I don't want to speak about things that are not my expertise. So when you're going or when you're looking at something as a possible example or as a possible implementation, you, you just really need to make sure that you're checking off all the boxes before you go ahead and do something. Because the worst thing that could happen is that you get yourself into trouble. And that's not what my intent is. And it's not I, I, my intent here is to show you that there is some out of the box thinking and that some of the most weird and absurd ideas can actually function, but we just, we really need to make sure that we check all those boxes first. So some of the examples won't work for two or three person um, enterprises or small businesses because they are a little bit larger than that. They're probably looking at about, you know, 20 to 30, uh, all the way up to, you know, 400. So it, it just, they're examples to kind of give you a, a, an idea that nothing is, nothing's off the table. It just needs to be massaged. So the other thing I want to go into is, of course, how do we restructure to deal with crisis? Because well, that's in the title of the uh, slides or the title of the presentation. So we want to be able to look at how do we go from regular operations to restructuring to deal with what's going on right now. Most people are trying to restructure to deal with, you know, COVID-19. So I'll kind of make some nuances and some, and some parallels to that. When we look at when a situation occurs, now it goes from a situation to an incident, to a disaster, to a crisis. So there's different levels of impact. So when a situation occurs, we just need to look and make sure that it operations can continue to operate as seamlessly as possible. Might not be a big problem yet. So we just need to be stay on top of things and we need to make sure that we're looking at issues that are occurring and make sure they don't evolve into bigger problems. So if things start to become bigger and we start to need other functions or more support, one of the things that you can do is from that risk assessment and that business impact, you can start to look at what is non-essential. When you know what's non-essential, you can move non-essential personnel into those critical functions, into those critical areas, and get them to support in whatever way they can. So that way then you have that additional support. So one of the things we look at, for example, is while HR is a very important function to business, um, there are only actually a certain few things in HR that are considered critical, one of which is pay, one of which is basically HR, like employee relations. Everything else that HR does can be stopped for a small amount of time, but some people have a very heavy HR department. So there are people there that could be doing other things. And I mean, there's no wrong there's no wrong idea with cross-training people so that way in case something occurs, you can pull people from other departments or other areas and put them into places where they can assist you to make sure that operations continues. Uh, cross-training is a good thing. Uh, it makes you more resilient, uh, especially if somebody calls in sick and you really need someone to fill into that position for that one day. It, it gives you more flexibility in, in things to continue operations. And again, like I said, the biggest part here is that we want to make sure that the customer sees little disruption. So even though everything, like I said earlier, even though everything might be going, you know, sideways in the back warehouse or in the back where the customers don't get to see it, by shifting all those people, you might actually be reducing what the, what the customer sees. Uh, and then for larger situations that become a crisis or disaster, there is a specific methodology. It's known as crisis management, um, and there are ways to break out a hierarchy. The one challenge to that is that crisis management uh, for businesses that are less than 20 are going to be difficult because you're already at a disadvantage when it comes to the amount of employees or the amount of people that are even in your business. The one problem that exacerbates that is with COVID-19 is that you may have limitations in how many people can be in your office at the same time, or the other real on, 
unfortunate event to this is that you may lose 20 or 30 percent of your staff due to symptomatic cases where they have to isolate based on public health information so it's a really fluid situation on how you can continually keep operations going when your personnel may be constantly changing because of the fact of of just unfolding circumstances so it is really a balancing act and that's why cross training uh, and at least basic cross training can really create that resiliency across departments or across functions of the business because then at least other people can slip into those positions for a temporary time they can help support and then they can move back to the regular functions so in a small business that has 20 um, it is called a crisis management team so it doesn't have to be elaborate but it basically functions around all those critical functions and it has one critical concept uh, that needs to be addressed so the critical concept is that you need to break your hierarchy into two the ceo or the owner stays at the top but all your executive head department people stay dealing with regular business as if there was no crisis and everybody else who's been assigned to the crisis management team then focuses only on the crisis and how to fix it uh, in the shortest amount of time possible by going through all the the risk analysis and the bia and everything else that's done pre-crisis there's usually you know methodologies or there's you know policies that are built in or at least step-by-step -step guides on how to do certain things so the big concept here is that we want to see that split into two this is a difficult thing and i know very experienced organizations that have a lot of difficulties with this especially at the end of the day when the CEO or the owner is going to be held accountable for everything that goes on anyway. That's the kind of the responsibility that comes with that position. And it is a difficult juggling uh, to not step in and take over that, that crisis. Uh, I mean, there are cases where CEOs have to step in and that comes down to with, you know, mismanagement of the crisis itself, where the CEO steps in and takes over because of mismanagement. But before that crisis occurs, we really need to look at who's going to be on what side of the mirror, whether it's going to be operations, regular business, or whether it's going to be crisis. Uh, and the CEO or the owners need to have a trust uh, that those people are going to be able to uh, stay in their own lanes and deal with things effectively uh, as designed uh, by the company. So one of the examples that I have is I did work with um, a municipality, uh, one of the CAOs, the chief administrative officer for that municipality. As soon as anything occurred, he automatically jumped into the crisis and he was in charge and that was the way it was going to be. Um, and he was very adamant that he must be in charge of that because it's, it is him at the end of the day that's going to answer to the elected officials and all the constituents in that area uh, that this crisis occurred and he's going to have to answer to it as to what was done. So that was his, his stance on it. But the problem was is that when he jumped over there, regular business functions fell to the wayside and there was actually some regular business processes that was shut down because there was no guidance there was nobody there to say yes or no and no one could make a decision uh, and the cao at the time was so busy dealing with the crisis that he couldn't make a decision because he didn't actually have an understanding of what was going on uh, so he couldn't make an informed decision so it's just a, an example where uh, it's very hard and it's very difficult and even myself I can be given a lane, but I find it very hard to stay in that lane uh, just simply because of my background and my understanding and, and my personal attraction to want to help, which is where most people um, feel compelled or pulled at. Because when we see a crisis happen, our first thing is that we band together and we all deal with it. 
but the reality is is that regular business functions have to continue to occur and we need to leave people there to do that to make sure that happens so here's kind of a basic overview of where where people should sit um, i know for small businesses you're probably not going to have the c acronym roles such as your operations officer your information officer privacy officers you're probably not going to have those but it gives you an, an idea at least saying that department heads, if you have department heads, should stay on that regular business side. And your crisis management team should be supervisors, should be subject matter experts in those other areas. So that way then they can best assess and deal with the crisis as fast as possible. Because the goal is, is that they want to get in front of the problem deal with the problem and then get back to normal operations so that way we can go back to being one unit um, we want to make sure that we can do that as fast as possible uh, to limit the amount of disruption so crisis management teams what do they kind of do well in a nutshell they take charge of the situation they determine the facts by either fact finding or at least getting updates as to what has occurred. Um, they then tell the story and by tell the story, I mean, they tell it to uh, first to the CEO because he needs to be aware he or she, the executive management team. So the regular business side, then you go to the rest of the employees. If you have employees outside of those functions, then you go to your customers and then to the media. The only time that the media supersedes any of that <clears throat> is in the fact where there's injury or the media is literally coming to your doorstep to find out what's going on because it's a larger issue. Then someone has to quickly gather all those facts and tell the media what is going on, what has occurred, what is going on, and what's being done. And if you don't know the answers, don't speculate. The whole point is honesty and being upfront with it. And more than likely, it's somebody who's going to be in a very senior management role or likely the CEO that's going to be addressing the media or the owner. The last thing that they're gonna to wanna to do is fix the problem. And when I say fix the problem, you can get the technology back online. You can reduce the amount of um, operations uh, effect so you can get operations back up to 100 percent it doesn't mean that the crisis is over uh, especially where the media gets involved and there's additional fallout for months but if operations is working at 100 percent at least your business is functioning so once that is resolved then people can slowly start to move out of that crisis management team and back into their normal roles it doesn't mean that you're not going to hear about the crisis later on down the road it doesn't mean that it's still not affecting certain things but it's being managed regularly through regular operations and regular business functions so it's no longer a crisis it's now just a situation again that again you just need to constantly monitor so this is great for something like a flood. This is great for something like a fire or for an injury, a workplace injury that gets publicized. These are things that have a definite end date. We understand that, you know, a fire occurs, the fire went in, the fire department showed up, put it out. Now we have to basically recover the building and get back to operations. We understand that there's a finite endpoint in that. Uh, same with a flood, damage done, gets recovered and repaired. We go back to operations injury occurs well person's taken care of they come back to work boom we're back to operations so in a pandemic environment this is where it becomes challenging because there is no end date even the extreme experts that are that we listen to all the time that we're taking our guidance from there is no end date on this and this is causing probably the biggest challenge for everybody across every economic value between every vertical market because nobody knows when the end date is so how do we know when we can start moving people out of crisis management and back into normal operations because it's so fluid so one example of that is we thought we kind of had things under control and we were moving okay and then we started to see provinces open up and we started to get back to a little bit of normal operations 
And then we started to see the B117 variant come into Ontario and Quebec. Well, that variant is very aggressive. Uh, it's the UK variant. Uh, it has a different um, public health uh, background to it, where it is very, very strict because of the transmissibility. So that changed everything. And I think people really got kind of caught with that because they were starting to get complacent and starting to get comfortable with, okay, so things are kind of now getting normal again. So let's pull people out of that crisis management. Let's get them back into normal work and let's move on, which is great. That's what we want to see people do, but we have to stay on top of that incident. It doesn't go away. So right now, I mean, we've been in pretty much aside from permanent lockdown since pretty much Christmas. I mean, my family is a family of five. We've had nobody in our house since, since before Christmas because of the public guidance, uh, because that's what's required of us. So when I look at that though, and I, and I say that, you know, that's great, but at what point here do we start opening up again? And, and we start relaxing those things to allow more people into business again, to allow people to do things. I, I mean, Ontario or Quebec had a curfew. Uh, I believe it's it's still under curfew at 8 p.m. at night. Uh, and that's that's a large adjustment for people. And I mean, how do you function in a business if curfew's at 8 o'clock? Because people need to get home by 8, not leave work at 8. So it's caused such a randomization that with no end date in sight that people are having some issues determining when they should be pulling back and when they should be at full uh, crisis. So my suggestion uh, for that in, in a very long story is we just need to make sure that we're staying on top of it. So, when I say that we're staying on top of it, what I mean is you should have one person that should be in charge and responsible for staying on top of the guidelines, that should be staying on top of what is going on right now in the area that you work in and in the province that you work in. For all of us, it's going to be Saskatchewan. But if you don't have someone in your business constantly checking that, and you miss something because you're, you're trying to do that while you're doing a ton of other things, it, it's sometimes that's the catalyst that can cause that issue where you start to pull back and you miss something. So having someone constantly monitor that, even if it's just a, a check every morning, uh, when they first get into the office, they log in, they check their email, and then they go to the government website to make sure nothing's changed. That's probably a, the best starting point you could have because at least then you know that everything is unchanged from the government which means that what you're doing right now is what you can continue to do i mean we are seeing a, a reduction in daily numbers which is really good and i suspect that mid-march we are going to see some relaxation of those rules but with that comes some additional responsibility because if we see an influx again in numbers, we're going to go right back to the state we're in now. So we really need to make sure that we can relax uh, on, on the crisis side. Maybe we can start pulling people back and maybe we can go back into regular operations, but the, you should still have someone monitoring what's going on. And even if it's just a fact check for an hour every morning, just to stay aware of the, of the surroundings. Um, some of the big things that can occur as well is you get a pocket of infection uh, in a certain town or in a certain locality or whether it's a certain community like a Hunter colony or something occurs. But if that's occurring close to you, it could affect how your business functions. So if you're not doing fact checks every morning, you may miss that cluster. Uh, and that could severely affect because if you're not making those adjustments on the fly, then uh, you may you may miss something that could drastically change the outcome uh, of your business. I have one last slide here and then I'll ask for questions. So, like I said, best practice has shown that having the dedicated person who can interpret and properly dissect information. Uh, 
So they're going to want to look at the government stuff, public health. Uh, they're going to watch the news um, just to see the highlights. Uh, I have a constant feed that comes into me at six o'clock in the morning, every morning. I have one for Saskatchewan, one for Alberta and one for Canada. And then um, I have a news feed that pops up internationally just because I watch the, the variants of her overseas. Um, but I can quickly scan through all those medias in, in about 15 minutes. If there's nothing there worth reading, I can move on with my day. But if there's something that you see, like it says, you know, uh, COVID positive uh, influx in Yorkton, that's something that you're probably going to want to stop and read because it could potentially affect what you're doing or it may have additional risks that come with that. Um, so one thing that I do want to note here is this last little, last little thing. So in the current environment that we are in, the, the biggest risk right now is our staffing levels, because if one person's COVID positive and a bunch of people are identified as close contacts, you can lose a lot of your staff. And the other big risk right now is infection prevention control and PPE, because one, infection prevention control changes based on the information and the research we have. And PPE changes because of how the infection transmission occurs. So, and everybody right now is buying PPE like it's going at a style. Uh, and they're doing that because of the fact that they need to have it um, to, to keep staff employed and to keep people in the business. So having all of those things come to play where, you know, most businesses never even thought of buying gloves or masks for employees or having them on site. It's now a requirement. Um, and it's just, we have to understand that that influx in the, the supply chain is going to cause disruptions as well. So we have to make sure that we're staying on top of all that other risk. Um, is there any questions? Um, hey Nick, uh, this is Priya again. I don't know if my question falls under today's session title, but uh, I just want to know since service industry is uh, something which is very uh, dynamic, it keeps changing, you know, uh, very quickly from you know um, the time and um, the new trend which has come in is the reviews on social media. So for for a business like restaurant, one unhappy customer can spread word like wildfire and it sort of damages, you know, the reputation of the entire restaurant. Uh, and people do, you know, read those reviews and make up their decisions, uh, you know, basis that review, which is unfair because one happy unhappy customer doesn't mean that their services are not you know worth a try so how, how does a business handle a scenario like that so specifically when it comes to uh bad media attention mm -hmm. so the old mentality is that all pr is good pr well i disagree with that old adage because bad pr is really bad um, the way that I've always kind of understood it is that if you do a good job for one person, they're going to tell one or two people. If you do a bad job for one person, they're going to tell 10 to 20. And that's how you get into that problem. And the creation of social media has made it so easy to spread information. And the likelihood is, is that there's also that anonymity factor that allows people to feel anonymous online. So they feel more free to actually express their opinion, um, which is where a bunch of the media concerns come in because everyone not only has an opinion, which is great, but sometimes that leads to misinterpretations or it leads to miscommunication. The one thing that I've always suggested to businesses is that if you're getting attention on any of your social media feeds, you need to answer people it stops a lot of problems. It stops rumors. It stops people from taking things out of context and be honest when, when you post your replies to that. If someone says, Oh, I had the worst experience ever in your response, say, we're sorry to hear that. We are here to make it right. Uh, you know, please contact us and we will discuss. 
Uh, some of them are going to continue to to hound that on social media. And the big thing is that you want to show to people that you are there to correct the mistake. People have a brand dependency or a brand um, that they prefer, not because the brand is better sometimes, but because of the customer service that comes with it. So personally, I judge where I buy my stuff based on the atmosphere and based on the value that the employees or the, the company treats me with. So if I'm treated with respect, if I'm seeing, even if there's bad reviews and I see that they're addressing those bad reviews and they are addressing them and they're dealing with them and they're making things right to the best they can, that to me shows that they care. And I think a lot of people are in that same kind of middle area where, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting what we ask for. So, I mean, if, if I go to a restaurant and something is, is subpar or it's not what I ordered, I do voice that. I personally call the restaurant and have a discussion with them. But if I was a social media person or a review person and I put it online saying, didn't get what I ordered, not happy the best thing you can do is reach out and say, wow, we're sorry for that. When did you order? You know, how long ago, how can we make this right? Or you can just stop the conversation and go, we are so sorry for that. He just let us know, um, you know, the next time you're in uh, refer to this tweet or this social media post and we'll give you 10% off. Yeah. Be because you're addressing something right away and you're mm -hmm. stopping that exacerbation uh, people are seeing that you're a company that comes online and addresses it right away. So they feel better if something does go wrong for their experience, at least they know that you're going to be there to correct it. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I just have one more question. I hope I'm not, you know, interrupting anybody else who, who wish to, you know, ask a question. I will pause for a second if anybody wants to raise a question, then I'll, I'll hold my questions for the end. Okay, uh, looks like uh, we have no more questions. So again, uh, Nick, I don't know if how much relevant this question is to today's presentation, but uh, one thing which I have witnessed as a customer, uh, you know, uh, from the start of this pandemic is there are a few people who, who do not want to, uh, you know, follow the guidelines of wearing a mask or doing social distancing and there are a few very difficult customers to handle um, and sometimes the conversations get really heated uh, so how do we handle situations like that where where we are having very difficult customers who are not ready to uh, you know follow the health guidelines uh, during this pandemic that's that's actually a really good question, Priya, because it's one of the common questions I get. So, for example, I'll just give an example. Someone comes into your store without a mask and refuses to to actually put one on. Would that be kind of where you're where you're going with that? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, if that occurs, one, it's really it's a difficult line because they may have a mask exemption. Uh, and most people that I know that do have mask exemptions are very forward and very open and honest about that. And they'll say, no, I have an exemption um, because of a, a, an underlying health condition. And they'll be open and honest and they won't get aggressive. But the other side to that is the, uh, for lack of a better term, the anti-maskers or the, the anti, you know, the pandemic is fake, or as I refer to them, the plandemics. Um, those types of people or that mentality uh, does cause concern. It does cause a lot of challenge for business. So the one thing that we've kind of expressed that is probably best practice is that reassuring the business, it is not your actual problem. Um, while it may seem to be your problem, the government stance is that it is not within the business's control to actually force a person to abide by that, nor is it your, your responsibility as a business to basically push someone out of your door. Uh, 
um, because that becomes, it leads to escalation, it leads to altercation and, and the potential of physical violence because you can't just manhandle someone. So the best course of action is to approach them when they first come into the store, be very assertive with that and say, look, this is the public health guideline right now. We do need you to don a mask and to abide by those rules because we have to as a, as a business. If they become belligerent, aggressive, or just saying, I'm not doing it, then the simple step of backing off and saying, okay, I understand that you do not want to comply. However, the understanding is, is that I have to phone the police. Okay because it is the responsibility of the local law enforcement to actually issue that ticket and that fine. And there are instances in the media where people have been pulled out of businesses and fined. Yeah. So it, it's, it's difficult. It's a hard line to tow because originally, I know there was discussion of making the businesses responsible for it. And the business community basically cried in outrage because as a business owner, I can't physically force somebody to put a mask on. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and it's not realistic. But also in that same context, as a business, I should then not be held accountable or responsible for someone not listening to the public health guideline. So the decision was made basically that the business will not be held accountable, but rather it is the individual that's held accountable. So the best course of action then is to, is to then inform local authorities because it is their decision then to either come to the site and deal with that person or to simply, you know, say, okay, well, it, it happened, just take a record of it. And then if anything occurs or comes out of it, at least you have a timestamp um, to show that this is when it occurred. So you can go back into your logs. One of the other things that we do suggest is that you create what we call a COVID log. So if you're not doing active sign in, sign out of your business, uh, which would be near impossible if you've got customers coming and going, at least if there's an incident that occurs, have it logged. So that way it's time stamped and what your actions were. So person came in without mask, you know, employee such and such approached, said they have to do this. They refused, you know, we called authorities and then time and date. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just an extension to the answer which you have given, like suppose there's, there was a, there was a customer who walked into your store and had, uh, you know, had been tested and, had been tested positive for COVID. Uh, what is the best approach for the business to take, you know, to communicate this to, uh, you know, a wider audience just for their own safety? Like, what do you think uh, is the, you know, best approach for a business to do uh, in that case? Uh, okay, so I just want to paraphrase to make sure I've got it right. Uh, you're saying like if it ends up that public health calls and says there was a COVID positive person within your business? Yeah. Okay. So in that case, the first thing that you're going to want to do, uh, my suggestion is write down a pre-formulated response today uh, if you don't already have one. So this can be a pre-populated with basically a fill in the blanks. Um, that way then you have time to think about how you want to present it. The best course of action is to, again, be open and honest. You're going to want to promote that or, or post that internally prior to externally. Um, and then you're going to want to do it as fast as possible. So sometimes you can do it simultaneously. Depending on where your tech levels are, like some companies are using WhatsApp, some companies are using internal comms, uh, things to get a hold of employees back and forth or have personal messaging systems versus just a regular old text uh, where you can share documents. So some will do it that way internally. Others will actually have a staff meeting or, or call the each person individually, depending on the size of the business and say, this has occurred at this time of day, you know, you were at work during this time. Can you call public health and follow those guidelines, please? Uh, and identify yourself. Or if you weren't at work at this time, you know, just be aware and extra cautious uh, that we are, you know, that this occurred, but you weren't there. It's important to make sure that all of your staff is aware of, a, of an incident, 
not just those that were involved. Um, when I say that though, if you have a staff member who's positive, only the people involved should be aware. And the, the delineation here is that it's privacy health information. So if a staff member tells you that they are positive, it is your responsibility to then address that with the individuals they were in close contact with through public health uh, guidance. However, you should not tell everybody in the general staff meeting that Sally was COVID positive because it's actually a breach of privacy health. <laughs> so it's, it is a difficult challenge to, you know, squash rumors because obviously if, you know, all of a sudden three or four people aren't coming to work, that's going to create rumors. Uh, and the big, the biggest thing that we can do here for these environments is to just simply say, look, we cannot discuss these things. We, we are, you know, we, we're not allowed, but, you know, we also want to ensure that we aren't doing rumors or false information. Uh, this is just something that has occurred. It has been dealt with and it's under, you know, the guidance of public health and their direction. Yeah. Um, so you want to, you want to be honest with people, but we don't want to breach privacy legislation, obviously. Yeah. Uh, when we talk to customers about it though, um, if you have the ability to timestamp those customers um, based on, you know, because it's a smaller company, like I know who my clients are because they're, they're in my office uh, and there's very few of them these days. If it was to occur, the realistic, the realistic outcome is that it's going to be me and that person that we're close contact um, for a sales environment you're going to want to just let your customers know uh, that that has occurred uh, probably through social media, but following the media announcement from the public health. So you're only going to want to kind of say what you know and what you can say. You don't want to speculate. So again, it comes down to public health will say that the, a COVID positive individual was at these locations around this time. If you fall into that criteria, please call public health. So you want to follow and mirror that message saying that, you know, please be advised to all customers that if you were in the store between these hours on this day, public health has identified that there was somebody in the store who was COVID positive, please contact public health and uh, public health and follow their guidelines. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, is there any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll move into the last, the last uh, section here, which is, Basically, I've broken them down into four categories. So some basic business acumen or business, business 101, um, how we can reduce some overhead, how we can increase some sales, and then some real creative thinking. Now, when I say real creative thinking, I mean some of this stuff was last-ditch effort. Uh, as you'll see, some of them are kind of maybe harsh, uh, maybe dark, um, but basically the difference comes down to if we have to start – the unfortunate reality is that if we have to start laying off people, which is probably the worst case scenario, the, the reality after laying people off is closing our doors permanently. So if we want to keep the company going, but have to face that bad reality that somebody's going to have to go, how do we really deal with that? And, and that's a difficult conversation because I'm sure like most of you, I fall into the same boat my colleagues, my employees, the people I deal with, they're not just a, an employee number. They're not just another person. I treat them more like family uh, and friends. So having those difficult discussions um, in a large enterprise where an employee is just a number is much easier than having that difficult conversation with somebody who's been a friend of yours or worked with you for years uh, and has done good work and it's for no fault of their own or yours. It is simply from a business perspective that you have to lay them off. And that is a very hard conversation to have. And the unfortunate reality is that some businesses may get to that. So while some of this creative thinking is 
dark uh, or very out of the box, non-traditional. Um, some of these things were thought of as alternatives to really having those conversations and what they could do to mitigate outside of doing a mass layoff. Um, and again, not everything here is going to uh, work for everybody. Uh, some of it may be common sense to some people and other people may be, may be surprised by some of the things or maybe that you've just been in crisis for so long that having somebody else say it will remind you of it. Because when we get into crisis, we put blinders on and we can only focus on so much stuff. Crisis creates more blinders because it creates more stress and, and a more difficult environment. So sometimes we are actually closing ourselves off to the bigger picture, uh, and then we don't see certain things that may be actual common sense stuff. So for business, regular business, number one, lead by example. If you're not willing to do something as an owner, as a CEO, there is no reason why you should expect your employees to do the same thing. Your employees don't have as much skin in the game in the company as you do. So the fastest way to lose face is to go and collect 100% of your paycheck and cut theirs by 50% or cut their hours by half. You will create such a negative environment that you're more likely to have people leave and be on unemployment or leave and find another employment or another position based on the fact of poor, uh, just and a poor example. And I use that one to, to highlight really the worst case, like what you really could do as a leader. Um, not that uh, anyone by any means on this call would ever do something like that, but it just highlights how easy it is uh, to, to lose face to an employee. Um, so the other thing that leading by example is that, you know, if, if you're there and you're talking to everybody in, in a staff meeting and you're saying, you know what, here's the reality. Uh, and this kind of ties into number two, be brutally honest about stuff. If the company's losing money every month and you are literally coming to the fact where you can't function anymore or continue in that environment, you need to tell the employees because the reality is, is that they already know anyway. Um, they, they may not know how bad it is, but they already are aware that there's something going on because tensions are high and stress is around and it's not the same office it used to be. Sorry, I had to clear my throat there. Um, so being brutally honest, uh, open, honest, having that communication and those open lines with people about how difficult it really is right now will actually go a long way. Um, employees and people generally will want to understand uh, and they will actually have an easier time dealing with the difficulty or the crisis if they know what's going on. Um, it's it's kind of counterintuitive because in business, we kind of have those things that we keep to ourselves as owners and as, as high ranking officials uh, where we understand that not it's that need to know basis, but because we can't determine the end time on this crisis or on this problem pandemic, we kind of have to change that mentality and having that open, honest conversation saying like we are basically in the red by X amount and give a round figure. You don't have to be like, you know, $8,352.21. It doesn't need to be that uh, specific. But people need to know that, you know what, the company's losing money every month. And eventually this is going to cause major hardship because we're either going to, you know, have people losing their jobs. We're going to have to shut down operations altogether and close the business. And then we're all out of a job. By telling that, people will actually man together. You'll see how people will um, support each other in crisis, even though um, they may be experiencing their own hardships outside of work. Um, there's there's an, a, a, a mentality in the military that a shared experience lessens the burden. So if you as a business owner are carrying all that burden, you're going to be stressed. You're going to be, you know, it, it, the the persona, the aura that you portray is going to be different and people are going to feel that and see it. And because you're taking that burden on all by yourself, 
because again, you are the owner, you have the skin in the game. You're the one that owns the company. It's your problem at the end of the day. And to be quite honest, you're the one that's going to be responsible for any problems that come out of it. But your employees can't help you and can't come up with better ideas if you don't tell them. It's just something that we have to kind of change our mentality around. And I'll be the first one to admit that was difficult for me uh, going into this. And this is what I do for a living. Uh, It was very hard for me to talk to my colleagues and say, look, guys, like basically all of our tenders got shut down. We lost a whole bunch of money and income for the year. We can't, I can't do this. It's just, it's not feasible anymore. We have to find other ways to do things. Um, So I, I had those honest conversations with my colleagues and with my other contractors that I generally partner with. And and we discussed through them and we came up with alternatives and we came up with other ideas on things we could do because basically the government tender system shut down for two months uh, when we quarantined in March of last year. And it nearly, it it nearly shut my doors and a bunch of other doors uh, from colleagues of mine, just because the fact that we rely primarily as government is our, our, our our number one vertical market because that's where we do most of our work. So it's difficult when that happens, but by being honest, we were able to sit down and have a realistic conversation of, well, what can we do? Um, And I put that at the bottom because again, for me, in theory, I could tell people that, but it was so hard for me to do in practice. It's hard to have that hard conversation uh, with, with people Uh, especially sometimes employees that may be on a lower level or not on the same pay scale as you, but it's something that we have to have and we have to kind of be open and honest about stuff. So the other thing is reducing overhead. So while this may seem very common sense, um, I actually found that a lot of the clients that I dealt with had such big blinders on that they weren't really looking at what they were holding. Um, And when I say that they had, a large warehouse that they were only using half of. Well, what can you do with it? Can you split it and rent the other half out to reduce some of your loss? Can you get out of the lease? Is it worth paying out the cancellation of the lease? Because it's just better for you to pay the, you know, pay the the fine or the cancellation fee to get out of it than it is to continue to pay for that and lose money every month. Um, I, I helped the business that uh, they were basically looking through debt consolidation, they were paying about $4,400 a month uh, for vehicles. Um, And because of the fact that they were so concerned about having people out and working and it it was a trade-based company. So, you know, you have work vans and work trucks and, but they were so concerned about having people be working and not sitting in the office doing nothing and still getting paid that they weren't actually looking at the fact that they had seven vans sitting out back, not doing anything. So we sat down, we looked at it and we said, well, look, these, these vans, what are they doing? Like they're sitting here, not doing anything. Can we move them? Can we get rid of them? Can we consolidate them into maybe two or three? So we took what they were losing in those payments and we moved it down to about four or $500 a month for them. So right there, you know, that's four grand a month. That's, that's a full-time paycheck. So we kind of removed some of that debt uh, out of, out of that to give them some more breathing room. And the other big trend that we're seeing right now is we're seeing that people are leaving offices and moving to online platforms. Some of these online platforms are so cheap and easy to use now that almost anybody can do them. Um, One of the big companies that I continually hear uh, is Vendesta. um, And they, uh, they have grown exponentially just because that's what they do. Their specialty is online platforms and helping small businesses get online. And they've been so successful during this pandemic because it's been such a need to switch the way we do operations. Because in an online platform, there is no max capacity. Uh, the max capacity is then determined by the amount of bandwidth that the online shop can hold, which is usually uh, thousands more than what your actual physical building can hold at the same time. So then the challenge with that, though, is that how do we then move into those online platforms and how do we manage the amount of actual inventory we hold? Now, these are all conversations that you'd have to have with suppliers and whatnot, but some suppliers 
will actually hold material and ship directly from supply. So there are instances where you actually don't even have to hold the material, therefore reducing the load on warehouse, and it can go directly from supplier right to customer. Um, these are not always going to be the case. You're probably going to still have to have that warehouse to, to hold certain items. But I mean, when we look at it, there is that ability um, in the restaurant in, in, or injury in the restaurant industry. Um, they've gone from in dining experience to basically takeout. Uh, the in dining experience is kind of it exists still. However, it is uh, right now at a premium because of the fact that uh, you know your capacities are lessened, and a lot of people are scared to go into public and sit somewhere because of the fact that they they know that the risk of exposure is higher if they're not in their home. So takeout is a big thing right now. Uh, and the whole support local movement. So local restaurants get more traffic because we understand that, you know, they don't have a big conglomeration or a big subsidiary behind them. That's going to help bail them out when they can't meet those end of month uh, bills. So in those cases, we're seeing that, you know, the, the Uber Eats, the things like that, that where you can move your restaurant online are now increasing because of the fact that it, you're almost being forced into it. Um, and it's a bad, the reason why you moved online is the bad side to it, uh, because obviously no one wanted to move online because of a pandemic, but it's actually a good thing. Because the more exposure you can get, and this is where, like Priya had said earlier, that, that social media really comes into play there. Because if you can show um, that, you know, you're supporting everyone you can, that you're doing everything you can, and that you really are, you know, doing other things, um, and you're moving to that online world to protect the customer and to reduce their risk, uh, and you can show, like, I know a couple of restaurants who have posted pictures of their kitchen and it shows their staff in like masks and like all the PPE so that way they can ensure that all the food that they're preparing is safe. Uh, like people really get a sense of safety or really sense of secureness in dealing with that industry or that, that uh, business because they see that you know, the business is taking this seriously and they feel more comfortable when it comes to actually buying something from that company. Um, so there, there is that side to it as well. I mean, you can use social media to push an online platform. Um, you can tell people like a curbside pickup is something that's new uh, that has gained a lot of traction with a lot of places in the last year as well. Um, if you have the ability to have the online platform do that, that's great because it's probably the mechanism that I use most because I still like getting into my truck and driving around. Um, but I don't necessarily want to go into Walmart for a half an hour and walk around and shop. So I go, I pull up to the curbside pickup, I call the number, stuff comes out to my truck, it gets loaded and I take off. It still allows me to get out, it allows me to go get some fresh air, it allows me to get away from my desk and my computer, but it doesn't put me at an exponential increase in risk. So if you have the ability to go to that curbside pickup, I mean, it, it's a very valuable uh, alternative. And I mean, if it comes to the fact that all it is right now is just putting a sign on your door to tell customers that all they have to do is call the store and you will actually collect everything. Like you'll write it down. They can do a phone order and then they just pull up and call the store and say they're here to pick it up. Like if that's all you can do right now, that's a step in the right direction because people are going to feel more comfortable doing curbside than coming into the store. And it's not because you've done something wrong. It's just because of the environment and the way that the, the media is portraying everything right now. Whereas the more exposure to the outside world we have and the more that we are close to people, the more likelihood there is of infection. So people even subconsciously um, feel that when they, when they walk outside their door. Uh, and it's not, it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just the way it is right now. So how can we increase sales? Well, if you have a sales team and sales work done commission, that's great. But what about 
everybody else in your company. There's, you know, support staff that are not sales teams. There's, you know, other people in other parts that are doing support functions and they necessarily don't ever deal with sales. If you have the ability, I mean, your, your biggest supporter of your business is the person that works there. And if you can tell them that, you know what, we're going to go and institute a new project. It says that if someone comes in and buys something and they put your name on it, that, you know, and again, this is depending on your profit margin, but if you have the ability to, to maneuver it and work it, that 1% of everything that's sold will go as an additional uh, portion onto that person's paycheck because you have a little bit of profit margin, you know, wiggle room, um, then you know what? Everybody's going to get 1%. So if that person comes in and says, well, I, I bought this because so-and-so from your company told me to come get it here because you guys would do me, uh, you know, you, you guys would treat me right. You guys are doing everything, you know, really secure and really safe. And you know what? That gives me some, some pride to shop locally. Um, then you know what? Give that, if you have the ability, give the, the employee a little bit for it. Um, they're going to be your biggest billboard because they understand the company inside and out. And if they understand that the more business you have in volume, the less red the company is, the more business that you have in volume, the more likely it is that everyone keeps their job and the doors stay open. These people are now going to have what's called skin in the game too, because of the fact that they understand that if they're bringing in more sales, there that security is there but they're also going to get a kickback out of it and i'm not saying this is going to work for everybody um the other thing you can do is obviously the top performer bonuses uh these do not need to be monetary things so when i say that if you have the ability to give someone a paid day off make that the bonus people want to be at work because they need to get paid if you have the ability to give someone a half day off because they've done something awesome or they brought in 10 extra customers this month or that, you know, they, they really controlled that situation really good. It was, you know, a bad situation and they've done a really good job. Give them a half day, make them, make them show that you appreciate that they're there. Make sure you do it within your limits. Um, and that the fact that you're not going to, you know, pull yourself deeper into the red. Um, but, these are all little things. And I, I use the term of giving people time off for free um, because it's one of the easiest things as an owner that we can do is just tell someone to go home and they're going to continue to get paid. The other thing that you can do, and it kind of goes into my next example on the next slide, is the idea of bartering. Um, and bartering is kind of an art that's been lost but is still used in certain contexts. And I'm seeing a more of a rise of it now where it's coming back, where people are like, I provide this service or I have these products and you need them, but I could really use this from you. Uh, and sometimes when you do stuff like that, you, you have to take into account that you're still gonna sell them something at the price that you would regularly sell it if someone was to come in to buy it. But Instead, you're just going to take it in kind for something else that they were initially going to sell you for that same commercial price. So you're just doing a transaction through non-monetary means. The, where this comes into and where the top performer bonuses can come into is that if you're doing, uh, for example, a trades company can do some work for a local motel or hotel, uh, say replace a replace a sink and a and a toilet in a bathroom as a plumbing company. Instead of getting paid for that, the the other thing you could do is you could say, okay, well, you know what, I really want to give my employees kind of a a weekend getaway, like a raffle type thing. Um, can you comp a night in a hotel? And a lot of hotels will actually do it because the odds are is that most people probably won't ever. Uh, actually follow through and use the uh, gift certificate. So gift certificates are a really good way to get around um, that because they only get used if they're ever redeemed. Um, I'm not saying give them out on mass, but they, there is a likelihood 
um, that they will actually not be redeemed. So you've given something away that could come back to cost you and you've accounted for that. But the odds are is that right now uh, they may not come back. So then you've, um, you've been able to do something extra for something that uh, in, in essence will actually cost you nothing in the long run. So again, with the bartering thing, um, you know, there, there's other ways around it. Uh, so now we kind of get into that creative thinking and the out of the box stuff. So internal projects. And what I mean by internal projects is where you've had something that you've thought about it, you know, it came up and you're like, Ooh, don't have time for that. Well, maybe now you do have time because not everybody's running around at hundred percent working all the time. Maybe the tempo and the workload um, is not as high as it once was. So maybe you have the ability to take some time and actually tackle some internal stuff that isn't really monetarily heavy, but time intensive. Um, whether that's, you know, looking through the policy book and really building back the policies uh, and doing a refresh, whether it's, you know, doing a deep clean of a kitchen in a restaurant um, that, you know, is done every so often, but, you know, maybe we could give it another go just because of the fact that, uh, you know, you've been working really hard and all the new measures and stuff and you want to really make sure you're up to code. So you could go and give an additional deep clean of the kitchen. Um, so by doing that, one, you're keeping your employees employed, you're keeping them going, you're keeping them working. Um, but at the same time, you're doing things that maybe have been put off, maybe a bit in the background, maybe would be a nice to have done, but now you have the time to actually get them done. So now's a good time to tackle it because you're probably not working as, as much or as hard as you once were. Um, and then the other thing is reassigning a task. So if you have stuff that is contracted out, so for example, HR, um, I've seen a large influx of HR tasks being contracted to external parties. Uh, if you have that ability um, and you have the, uh, the, the knowledge of the employee base, sometimes you can go and it's cheaper to actually train someone to do the HR function than it is to pay the third party company. So if that is the case, maybe it's time to pull back and bring things back to in-house where it might be cheaper. Uh, these are things that, you know, there, there's kind of a dual profit to that because now that person who's now reassigned for that additional task, one, they're going to get some additional training, which is always good to have because it looks good on a resume and some exposure to something new. But uh, the, other, the other side to that is that you're probably going to end up paying less in the end for the same task to be done. Now, there may be bumps, there may be hurdles that go along with that, but sometimes pulling back just because of the fact that uh, the bottom line is, is that we can't, we can't maintain business in the red forever. So if we can reduce um, outgoing uh, or, or expenses at this point in time, sometimes it's just what we have to do to survive. So here's where we start getting into the reducing hours at work because we don't either have enough work for people to do or we can't afford to have them and this is where it gets challenging because this is where the out of the box stuff really starts to come and you'll see just by the titles that i've got highlighted that they are quite um out of the box or ambiguous so half pay double vacation time if you can you some employees would rather take double vacation time and be off double as long. But the thing is, is that they only get half of their pay. So some employees will take advantage of that because some will be like, you know what? I'd rather be at home with my kids and my family, or I'd rather not be at work. Um, and if they don't have that financial constraint, then you know what? They'll be like, okay, the half pay doesn't actually really bother me, um, but I get double the time off and that's an incentive. So some are going to take advantage of that. Some are not. Um, it's simply because of financial constraints or financial hardship or the fact that they just don't like the idea in general. Uh, or some people enjoy being at work and they don't ever take vacation and they're forced to. So they're not going to obviously take double vacation. Um, so that's an alternative. 
The other one is kind of, it looks counterproductive, um, but if there's not enough work in your office and you're paying people to be there full time and they're sitting around doing nothing, you're better off to send them home and make them work half time and give them a three quarter day pay. Because if they're going to sit there anyway and not do anything or not be actively engaged working uh, and more doing like makeshift work jobs or looking for work because there is no work to be done, um, sometimes they're better off, you know, to pay them for that three quarter day and send them home at the half day. And if you do that over time, um, I, I have it written out here in my notes, if everyone in a department of 20 people took advantage of that, you'd save five days of pay every day. So while you are essentially only getting, the, the downside to this is you're only going to get a half a day of work out of them and you're going to end up paying them for a quarter day they didn't work. But if you need to cut down on the red, you've also not paid them for another quarter of that day. And the more people you have, the higher return that is. Now, small departments may not be feasible. There may be enough work to go around, but I have seen this employed um, just because when you play with the numbers and you look at it, it actually will work in volume. Um, I, I have had many people look at me really weird when I say, well, have them work half time and have them get three quarters of pay because it's, it's counterintuitive. You're paying them for not being at work, um, but it does work uh, with the right numbers. Number 13, and this one is where I said that things get a little really out of the box or really kind of dark. And um, I'll preface this by saying, number one, don't call it the dreaded raffle. Um, the, the dreaded raffle was actually the coined term that the employees used. Um, there is a basic concept to it. Uh, and this was done uh, on the premise of after that honest discussion and the, the realistic discussion that people needed to be laid off. Um, and the staff or the, the head management of that company said, look, we don't want to hire, we don't want to lose anybody because everybody deserves to be here. But the realistic reality is, is that we can't afford to pay for everybody to be here. So that means that we have to lay people off and it's not, it's not anybody's fault. They said they would do whatever they could to support them and give them references and try and assist them whatever way they could, but they just couldn't continue to be in the red. So what they said was that basically we're going to pull names out of a hat because we can't choose who can't be here. It just, we can't. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody's important. Everybody supports everybody. And it's not fair to anybody to lose their job. And they didn't want to be responsible for causing those four people to lose their job. So instead, they said that we're going to have to do it by raffle. It's the only fair way where everybody has an equal chance and it's it just the only way that they could think of doing it. And the people in their office actually turned around and said that they would rather, um, instead of the raffle, they would rather each reduce their hours by f four hours each week, which then covered the 80 hours that they needed to reduce uh, every week. So the employees actually banded together and came up with an idea and said, you know what? We would rather share that burden and take four hours back. And each of us go down four hours to cover that loss than to see anybody go. And it was only because of the fact of that honest discussion at the beginning, saying that we have no alternative and there's no way out of this. Um, and it, was, and it was not something that they, they came with like one day and said, look, this is the reality and this is what we're doing. It was, this is the reality and we're open to examples. We're open to interpretation. We're open to do anything we can to keep everybody here. And this was over the period of weeks where finally it was, if we don't lay people off, we're just going to close the doors and we're all out of business. 
So it was kind of a last ditch effort to try and keep as many people employed as possible or kind of commonly more referred to as the greater good. Um, but they just couldn't bring themselves to tell anyone in that company that they were going to be laid off. Uh, so it was only through kind of that dark atmosphere and environment and that open discussion of, of stress and laying it all on the line that the employees really came up with kind of something that was out of the box um, because they said that they would rather share that burden because then at least that way they're all employed still. And this may not work for everybody. It may not be something that's going to occur, um, but it's just, this is how, how desperate some people are now getting. Uh, and, and in the reality of the, that people, even, even management and owners understand that everybody right now is experiencing some kind of financial hardship, whether it be, you know, spouses losing jobs or, you know, bills not getting paid because of reductions in hours and like everybody's feeling that stress. But at the same time, if businesses don't pull back and get out of the red, then they close and then it just, it, it cascades into a larger event. Um, so then, Kind of lastly, like the staff, your staff will all have different ideas. They will all have different experiences, backgrounds, knowledges, um, things that they see in their workday that can get put into a different efficiency to reduce time or reduce the amount of money that the company is, is pulling out to make some of these things happen. So the employees are really excellent at their job. And they do have some real good problem, problem solving skills if you identify that large problem, which again comes with being honest. Um, because the fact that in the last example, they, they had to reduce that, that red every month and this was the only way around it and they had those discussions over a course of weeks and trying to solve problems that the staff actually stepped up and found a way to solve the problem. But if the company would have came and said, okay, you know what, at the end of the week, we're laying four people off, or even worse, they wouldn't have said anything. And just on Monday morning, there wasn't four people in the office and everyone wondered where they went. Um, it's, it's not as likely that the employees are going to feel uh, like they are part of the solution, um, more so that it's kind of that cold atmosphere where they're just at work to work and then they leave and that uh, their contributions may not be seen as, as contributing to the overall mission of continuing that business. Uh, but like I said at the beginning, uh, the owner should never expect the employee to do that. It's, it's not something that they, there should be an expectation. But the reality is, is that people will band together through crisis. Um, the last example that I have is the anonymous pay reduction. Um, so this was again through a company that I saw extreme financial hardship with. Um, they had no real other alternative uh, to basically start laying people off. And it was actually the staff had come up with this. Um, one guy came up with it and he said, well, why don't we just get people to write their name on a piece of paper and just put how much of a pay reduction they're willing to take temporarily until, you know, we can get back on our feet and get sales back up and we can get out of the red and then we can move forward and then people can get paid back as we get money. And everyone kind of laughed at it because realistically, who's going to put their name on a piece of paper and willingly take a pay reduction during this time? Um, so when the two owners found out about that, the partners found out, they actually went and had a staff meeting and said, look, we heard this and here's our, here's our take on this. They put a box out, they put their names on a piece of paper and they showed everybody that they were taking a 50% pay reduction that day uh, until they were back in the black and everybody else was paid up. So they really put forward that lead by example saying that no, we're taking 50% right now. And, and they actually showed through kind of how much that overall overhead really played into that. Um, and then they said, you know what, if you want to put zero, put zero, but this is what we are doing. We're showing you that we're here to support you, to keep you all here. And if this is maybe an alternative, 
to temporarily solving a problem until we can get back on our feet, then this is what we're willing to do. Um, they actually showed um, that employees were ranging from zero uh, into like that zero five percent. Um, one said 75 because he didn't actually need the money. He was retired and he just liked being there. Um, but basically this company bonded over this complete hardship uh, and they regained now they've successfully regained everything they've lost. Um, and they've actually paid back most of the losses that employees willingly gave up. Um, and the plan is, is that once everything goes back to normal, they're actually going to give another bonus to all the staff just to show the appreciation that they had to everybody um, because of that adversity and because of that, that shared experience. So kind of in summary here, the last few examples, there are very extreme cases. Um, and it probably, you probably understand now why I put the caveat at the beginning of the presentation. However, through all of that, we can show that there are a bunch of commonalities is that everybody here is suffering at some point in some capacity and that we don't like seeing other people suffer or have burden. And we would rather share that burden versus let someone have the burden all to themselves. The other thing is that people are really inventive when it comes to problem solving. Um, some real out of the box thinking can occur. And when that burden is shared, there's actually less overall suffering on one individual uh, as, as rather than a collective. And I made a statement earlier saying that the, the military has a shared experience, less hardship mentality. Uh, but we can really see this now where there is a correlation coming from business, where people are really, the pandemic is causing this, this trauma or this extreme stress levels. And what they're doing now is they're, they're bonding together in a way that they've never bonded before. And they're leaning on each other because everyone has different backgrounds. Everyone's got different experiences and everybody has a breaking point that they need assistance. But by leaning on everybody, they're actually able to face a bigger problem. So the big takeaway here is that while business has a certain set of original guidelines, um, we really need to start thinking out of the box as to how we can continue business um, and sometimes those examples are not going to be uh, a one size fits all. Sometimes it's going to be specific in nature to the exact problem that you're facing. But creative solutions should not be discounted. The, the amount of creativeness that you can come up with is actually quite surprising when, you, when everybody puts their head together to come up with a solution. Otherwise, I am here to take questions uh, for, I believe, another 20 minutes or so. Um, I appreciate everybody's time today. I know that this is uh, its kind of that hot topic. Um, the other thing, too, uh, just my last closing comments here is that I understand that it, even if you've done the risk assessment and the business analysis uh, that I kind of presented in the last, um, the last presentation, sometimes we don't like to for lack of a better term, air our dirty laundry to a bunch of people. Uh, and we don't like to discuss our, our specific business problems in a group. And I totally understand that. Um, I really like to do these presentations in person because we get that more of that social interaction. You can see how people are reacting and you know who's going to talk and who's not. But in these, it's a, it's a little more less formal because everyone's got their camera off and you know everyone's in PJs being comfortable. Um, so the big thing here is that if you want to talk, we are here. Uh, my phone number is there. My email is there um, as well. Instead of giving you handouts that, is, that address generalities, uh, the other thing that we're doing is everybody that's here um, on the presentation uh, can feel free to call me. I'll give you an hour of my time. And we'll go through specific problems. We'll see if we can troubleshoot. We'll see if we can go through some stuff. 
and we'll see if we can come up with some kind of solution that's specific to you and your market and your your business. Um, these things sometimes can't get answered by general questions. And I do try to keep presentations quite general so that way we can get concepts and you know what's happening overall. But when we specifically get into a certain vertical market, there are certain things that can be done um, that wouldn't apply to every other market. But to try to go through every vertical, this presentation would be eight hours long. So I just want to just want to let everybody know that I'm here and that I will give you an hour of my time to address specific problems. All you have to do is email me or call me and set up a time. Uh, Priya, I will hand it back to you. Okay, uh, so I will wait for a couple of minutes if somebody has any questions for Nick or he did provide his contact information. You can directly reach out to him and you can chat about your business specifically and if there's something which he can help you with. Um, if there is nothing else, we just have some closing comments from two participants. Uh, Sean says, I like the idea of training, but the cost of this might be bad as we do not know the length of the crisis for the return of the investment. And then Les is thanking you for the presentation. He feels it was very informative. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so yeah, thank you, everyone. I did forward you the presentation uh, which Nick has presented today. Uh, I hope the session was you know, useful and informative to each one of you. If you guys need any more for the help, uh, you can either reach out to me or to Nick directly. I will be sending Nick's contact details right away after the session. Thank you everyone uh, for joining, especially thank you Nick for taking time uh, out of your schedule and doing this session for us. Um, I personally really enjoyed because these are certain uh, scenarios which I personally myself have experienced, you know, um, as a customer and being in um, a role, you know, where we do give business advice, I thought that we should have a bit of more clarity on, you know, how to handle things. So thank you so much for clarifying all my questions. Uh, if there's nothing much, I won't keep you all waiting. Um, thank you so much for joining and uh, hope to see you guys in our further sessions. Thank you, everyone.